B. Thank you so much for joining us in the studio. What's your take on uh, what we've got this morning, but also how it fits in sort of the broader picture of the uh, Chinese economy, how it's holding up right now? Right, this morning, uh, Chai Sin's uh, index uh, uh, better than expected mm. and uh, strongest in three years. But uh, that in contrast to over the weekend, you know, the official PMI. So that tells us that um, the, uh, I think the situation is still mixed. I think it's still uneven mm -hmm. for China. So you have the Chai Sing basically on a smaller group of uh, a smaller companies, whereas the official index is more focused on the larger SOE types. Mm -hmm. So it's not an even picture that we are seeing. And this is as what we expect for China. It's not going to be boom, booming all around, but it's going to have some uh, mixed effects here and there. So where does this leave the policy response then? Because... This, no doubt, mm. lopsidedness is building mm -hmm. the case perhaps for more stimulus. But we know right. that the PBOC's hands are tied, mm -hmm. and that is largely because of the direction of the Fed right now. It's right. not going to front-run the Fed. But at the same time, it's not weak enough to sort of warrant any sort of big bang stimulus. So it's a bit of a conundrum. And, I mean, many economies are facing this in central banks around the world. But specifically for China, where does that leave the policy response, do you think? So for the policymakers, yes, indeed, uh, China policymakers, uh, we are talking about just now, you mentioned about PBOC, uh, the central bank uh, is basically constrained by, you know, the pressure on the currency. And as a result, interest rate policy may not move, cannot move as much as uh, they want it to be. Uh, they want it to. But at the same time, at the fiscal policy side, Right, the consideration for being prudent and also not to uh, create all this moral, moral hazard issue, preventing them from uh, doing the big bang measures that you talk about. As a result, what we have been seeing um, since um, a few years ago, since uh, COVID, mm -hmm. has been really drip feed measures that, uh, that, that put in, and despite the policy, uh, property market, you know, behaving uh, or, or, or rather. Uh, prices drop so much uh, mm. for the for the property market, and mm. the government, central government, is basically constrained mm. in their prudence. Yes. Yep, jumping in here, um, Sam was raising mm -hmm. a moment ago the question mark over the future of what's happening with the deflationary environment in China. Mm -hmm. And when you take a look at manufacturing capacity and overcapacity has certainly been a, a very pointed concern for the US and Europe amongst others. Is external demand and domestic demand in China strong enough to be able to absorb that manufacturing capacity, which is incredibly important. It holds the key to whether or not things like producer prices can recover. Mm -hmm. Right. For China, I think the um, uh, one thing is that the excess capacity that people talked about is actually that is a reality in China because of these uh, shifts in production out of China. As a result, what you are seeing in some sectors, there are some excess capacity. So uh, producer prices may not uh, rise as, uh, as, much as, uh, as much as they want. At the same time, um, demand, uh, domestic demand is also not as, um, not as strong as what it used to be. So as a result, in China itself, the deflationary pressures are much greater compared to other countries where you have inflationary pressures plus all these uh, supply chain um, uh, shifts and also the shipping uh, disruptions that we have been seeing outside of China. So it's a totally different, uh, different set of uh, problems that uh, China is facing compared to um, other parts uh, of the world.